troubles in the Middle East continue. Tensions rise. Violence flares. But there seems to be no solution in sight. The superpowers struggle to avoid a wider conflict, but many fear that this region that gave birth to Western civilization may one day bring about its destruction. We can know what the outcome will be. An amazing prophecy shows how events in this region that will soon shake the world were predicted 2,500 years ago. The Worldwide Church of God presents the world tomorrow. The world today is a world of progress and poverty, triumph and tragedy, hope and frustration. Why? For more than half a century, this program has given a unique understanding of the meaning behind today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. This week on The World Tomorrow, David Hume. Greetings. The Middle East is seething with crisis after crisis. According to experts in geopolitics, all the elements of a global conflict are present in that region. A former British ambassador to the United Nations has said that if World War III were to start, it would begin in the Middle East. Is this powder keg about to ignite starting a chain reaction that will lead to World War III. This troubled part of the world is recognized as one of the great cradles of human civilization. In the rich lands that border the Nile and in the fertile crescent that stretches from the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf, great empires and civilizations have risen and fallen. The Egyptians, the Hebrews, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Arabs. For centuries, these lands were the center of the known Western world, a crossroads where the cultures of Africa, Asia, and Europe met to trade and exchange ideas. The Middle East was the birthplace of the three influential religions that helped shape the thinking of modern Western man, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All lay claim to the city of Jerusalem, known as the city of peace. But there is no peace. The Middle East has long been a region of upheaval, violence and passion, and today is no different. There's war, terrorism, bloodshed, agony, and heartbreak. But seemingly no solutions to the complex web of problems that pit nation against nation and brother against brother. And the prophecies of the Bible show that this seething cauldron of frustration and discontent will overflow and bring all the world to the brink of annihilation. It's only now in this 20th century that we can begin to understand an amazing prophecy written 2,500 years ago. It's a forecast that accurately foretells a war that will eventually involve all the nations of the world. This is the longest and most detailed prophecy in the Bible. It shows why the problem of the Middle East will plague world leaders in the years ahead. I'm referring to the amazing prophecy that's recorded in the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel. Now we spend a lot of time on the world tomorrow in the Old Testament book of Daniel. To recap quickly then, this book contains a series of far-reaching prophecies about this present world. God revealed to Daniel detailed information about the end of the age, the time we're now living in. Daniel lived more than 500 years before the birth of Christ. He was a young Jewish nobleman held captive in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You remember the story of how Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed a strange dream, and only Daniel, among all the wise men of Babylon, was able to interpret it. He explained that the king had dreamed of a great image, which in symbol pictured four great empires that would dominate the world from his time right up to our time now, a time called the Latter Days. 
The head of gold represented Babylon itself. The chest and arms of silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire that followed. The belly and thighs of brass was the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And the two legs of iron and feet of iron and clay pictured the great Roman Empire, which was to continue in various forms to our day and just beyond. Now that's all in the second chapter of Daniel. Chapter 10 of this mysterious book adds a little more to the story and is the prelude to the longest continuous prophecy in the whole Bible, Daniel chapter 11. In Daniel 10 and verse 14, Daniel is spoken to by an angel, apparently the archangel Gabriel, and told this, Now I am come to make you understand what shall befall your people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Notice the message is for the latter days. And whenever the Bible uses that language, the latter days, it refers to the end of this era or age of man. Now that's not the end of mankind or the end of the world, but it's the end of this civilization of man. When we formed our own governments and our own cultures, followed our own minds and not followed the counsel of God and his ways. For 6,000 years, man has been developing his own societies, political systems, ways of life. And yet our imagined progress has brought us to the point of our own destruction. We, in these latter days, have invented the means to destroy all life many times over. Never in all of human history has man possessed such destructive weapons as now from hydrogen bombs to neutron bombs, from advanced chemical and germ warfare to multiple warheads raining down from space. We've invented it all, and man has never invented a weapon that he has not used sooner or later. But God says in his word that a new world government is coming that will prevent man from annihilating himself the Creator Himself says He will step in to prevent man's ultimate madness. In Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, Jesus Christ said this, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now that new world order or government I spoke of is not a left or right wing political takeover, nor is it some science fiction dream or a figment of the overly religious imagination. It's not some ethereal heaven with golden streets and fluffy white clouds and people playing harps. It's a practical down to earth solution to the problems of this planet. And this prophecy in Daniel 11 shows us how that will be achieved. In amazing precise detail, it outlines key events that lead to God's intervention in human history. In this astonishing prophecy, you can see history written in advance. Daniel wrote during the days of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and Darius the Mede, long before the events foretold here. But God can foretell events far in advance as he says in Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So let's look at some of the highlights of Daniel 11 and show from the pages of history that God was unerringly accurate in what he inspired Daniel to write. In verse 2 it says, And now will I show you the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. At the time that Daniel was given this prophecy, the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar had fallen to the Medo-Persians. Daniel was writing this in the days of the Emperor Cyrus. The Medo-Persian Empire was to be superseded by the Greco-Macedonian, 
the rich fourth king referred to in verse 2 was Xerxes, and he did stir up war with Greece, just as Daniel wrote. Later, Alexander the Great of Greece came to power and fought the Persians in the Battle of Issus in 333 BC. Then he swept on down into Egypt and finally crushed the Persians at the Battle of Arbela in 331 BC. From there, he marched on a path of conquest all the way to India. All of this is recorded history, but notice how precisely it matches with verse 3 of Daniel 11, written over 200 years earlier. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Now, verse 4 foretells the fall of Alexander the Great and the division of his empire. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. The Greco-Macedonian empire was split into four divisions by Alexander's generals. They were first Ptolemy, ruling Egypt, part of Syria, and Judea, Seleucus, ruling Syria, Babylonia, and territory east to India, thirdly, Lysimachus, ruling Asia Minor, and finally, Cassander, ruling Greece and Macedonia. From now on, the prophecy of Daniel concentrates on just two of these divisions, Egypt, called the King of the South, because it's south of Jerusalem, around which these prophecies center, and Syria to the north, known as the King of the North. This prophecy continues outlining the key events in these ancient nations with great precision, and it's something you need to study for yourself. Now, at the end of this program, I'm going to offer this free booklet, The Middle East in Prophecy. It'll give you much more on the historical facts surrounding this prophecy as it proceeds step by step. But now I want to move quickly forward in time and show what it has to say about the 20th century, because this longest prophecy covers at least 2,300 years of history through to our time and beyond. Now remember that throughout this long prophecy, two kings are mentioned, the king of the north and the king of the south. As the prophecy progresses, the identity of each king changes, of course. I said that Jerusalem is central to this prophecy. The kings are called north and south, because of their geographical relationship to Jerusalem. The king of the north is to the north, and the king of the south is to be found south of the city. Now that probably sounds elementary, but I repeat it because it's vital to understanding who these kings are as time goes on. But let's notice the last part of Daniel 11 and verse 32. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. This brings us to the first appearing of Jesus Christ, and in the days of the apostles, people became spiritually strong and did great things in God's service. Now in verse 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Jesus and the apostles did instruct many, but Jesus was put to death. And history indicates that all the early apostles were martyred, with the exception of John. In verse 35, we read this, And some of them of understanding shall fall, to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Notice that the prophecy extends to the time of the end. So here is described in general the whole course of God's people, from the days of Christ to the present. But let's pick up the prophecy in verse 36, now describing the events in the early New Testament era. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. 
This is a king of the north, but who is he? About 60 years before the birth of Christ, Syria was swallowed up by Rome and became a Roman province. Later Roman rulers also controlled Judea, which was now part of the empire. So the king of the north here referred to becomes at this time the emperor of the Roman Empire. This verse says that he should do according to his will, and he did. It said he would exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. The Roman emperors required all of their subjects to worship them and to sacrifice to them as a god. Emperor worship was a hallmark of Roman rule. Now, the Roman Empire has continued in various forms to our day. That's clear from history and from earlier prophecies in the book of Daniel when you put them together with the New Testament book of Revelation. So now this prophecy comes down to the end of the 19th century and the very present century. In verse 40, we find this. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. There it is again, the time of the end. This prophecy continues right down to our day. Have you ever thought that God was very active in so-called Bible times, but in the 20th century he leaves us to ourselves? Well, this prophecy shows that God is concerned with our modern age. Daniel 11 shows that God doesn't stand by and let history take its course. That's especially true in these dangerous modern times of destructive weapons and total war. So now let's pick up this prophecy again. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Who is the king of the south in the 20th century? It can no longer be the king of Egypt, because in 31 BC, Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire, swallowed up by the king of the north. But before this, in the reign of Ptolemy III, back in 247 to 222 BC, Egypt annexed part of its southern neighbor, Ethiopia. Egypt and Ethiopia were united under one government several times in the next 200 years. But the only part of the King of the South's territory that remained independent of foreign domination until the 20th century was Ethiopia. In fact, Ethiopia was the only country in all East Africa that continued independent and had a government and kingdom dating back before the Roman Empire. The facts of history and the Bible show that in the 20th century, the king of the north will be a descendant or a revival of the Roman Empire, while the king of the south was to be Ethiopia. At the time of the end, our time, this king of the south was to push at the king of the north. Now, what does history show us? In late 1895, King Menelik of Ethiopia sent an army of nine to 10,000 men against General Baratieri's Italian army stationed north of Ethiopia in Eritrea, then belonging to Italy. To the southeast was Italian Somaliland. General Baratieri with 13,000 men tried to defend Eritrea against the Ethiopians. He lost 7,600 troops and more than 3,500 were taken prisoner. The Italians, who were inexperienced in fighting in mountainous country and greatly outnumbered, were cut to pieces. Because of their defeat, Italy demanded revenge. In 1922, the fascist dictator Mussolini came to power in Italy. He boasted that he would re-establish the glory of Rome and vowed to avenge the humiliation of Italy's army by the Ethiopians. So 40 years later, in 1935, Mussolini attacked the practically defenseless Ethiopia. Now notice verse 40. And the king of the north shall come against him, against the king of the south, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. A whirlwind comes in the air sweeping everything before it. Mussolini did send a great air force into Africa with many modern chariots, trucks, tanks, etc., and ships loaded with soldiers. More than 100,000 Italian troops sailed to Ethiopia. But here, Mussolini's part in fulfilling this prophecy ends. In verse 41, it says of the king of the north, 
he shall enter also into the glorious land, the Holy Land. Mussolini didn't do that. This is yet to be fulfilled by a future revival or resurrection of the Roman Empire. When the coming revival of the Roman Empire takes the Holy Land, then the nations will be plunged into the initial phase of the great and final crisis at the close of this age. Now continuing verse 41. Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now those names represent real nations in the Middle East today. Any Bible atlas will show you that Moab's ancient lands were on the east bank of the Jordan, as was Ammon. Today, the capital of the modern land of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan is Amman. So although these prophecies may seem to be couched in old-fashioned language, when you understand, they have a very real significance for us today. This future European ruler will cause great havoc in the Middle East, which you'll notice is still at the center of this controversy. In verse 42, we find, He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Verse 43 says the Libyans and Ethiopians, and notice that after its conquest by Mussolini, Ethiopia is no longer referred to as the king of the south, but here the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps, and the king of the north will then control them. Now in verse 44, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make or sweep away many. That news coming out of the east and out of the north comes from Russia and the Orient. They are north and east of Jerusalem. Together they trouble the revived Roman Empire. Russia will then enter the war. Now what is the time frame of this conflict? at the close of this remarkable prophecy. The next chapter, Daniel 12 and verse 1, tells us, And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. When you begin to understand this long and detailed prophecy, it's very encouraging and reassuring. We can see that God has not been a helpless bystander in human history standing on the sidelines, desperately trying to save some people, while humanity as a whole hurtles towards destruction. Not at all. God has certainly given man free moral agency and allows him to make mistakes so that he may eventually learn lessons. God has a plan, and he's never wavered from that plan. He's never lost control of history, and his plan for mankind is right on schedule. This prophecy shows that. Now, there are many other places in this amazing prophecy that show God's intervention right up to this modern age. I don't have time to go into them all in this program, but I do want to offer you a booklet that will show you more. It's the Middle East in Prophecy. You'll see for yourself how the tensions of the Middle East will escalate and plunge us into the war we all dread, nuclear World War III. That's the war that nobody, no life anywhere can survive. Now, God won't cause this war, but he will allow it to start. And he will intervene to stop it. Because as Jesus said, unless those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved alive. When we put all of these prophecies together, we can see that we're living in those days that Daniel and Jesus Christ foretold. Most of us are going to see these things happen in our lifetime. You and I need to be ready. Jesus warned that these terrible times will catch most of the world unaware. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. But Jesus also told us how we can be prepared and even how to escape the terrible events that are just ahead. He said, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. He said, you can escape. This free booklet, The Middle East in Prophecy, will show you how. The Middle East in Prophecy covers much more of the detail of today's program. I think you'll be amazed as you follow this prophecy verse by verse in your own Bible and see how it all fits together. 
Now, along with it, I want to send you this companion booklet, Who or What is the Prophetic Beast? This booklet gives a very clear understanding of Bible prophecy for our time. To really understand prophecy, you need to know how the books of Daniel and Revelation, written nearly seven centuries apart, fit together. And here's a chart that puts all of the major prophecies together for you in a way I've seen nowhere else. These two booklets will help you begin the most exciting and probably the most important study of your life. Now, we've nothing to sell on the World Tomorrow program. Both of these publications are free. There's no cost, no obligation, and no request for money. So why not go to the telephone now, and for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008 074 That's 008 074 And request the Middle East in Prophecy and Who or What is the Prophetic Beast. And while you're at it, also request your free subscription to The Plain Truth, a mass circulation magazine printed in seven languages and read by millions worldwide. The Plain Truth is the only magazine of understanding that really explains world news in the light of Bible prophecy. The Plain Truth contains articles to help you, articles on the family, how to solve problems facing society today, as well as those on current events and world trends. So for a free subscription to The Plain Truth and these free booklets, The Middle East in Prophecy, and Who or What is the Prophetic Beast, please telephone 008-074-222. That's 008-074-222. Or if you prefer, you may write The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Next week, David Albert will be discussing one of the most important and yet sensitive issues facing us today. Why is it that we can be successful in eliminating some terrible diseases, yet new, even more dreadful epidemics have taken their place? Until next time, then, this is David Hume for The World Tomorrow. For the free literature offered on this program, write The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008 That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. This is David Hume for The World Tomorrow. For the free literature offered on this program, write The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008 That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001.